You're listening to Inclusive AF with Jackie Clayton and Katie Van Horn. All right. Welcome to, I don't even know what episode of the Inclusive AF podcast. I'm Katie Van Horn. And I'm Jackie Clayton. And welcome to the party for all of those yeah. watching on YouTube. <laughs> Jackie's got a party going on and, and her Zoom. Me, I'm just boring in my office. I you have apologize. have a disco ball. It's a party. Oh, that's true. I do have my disco ball, so I'm, I'm stepping it up. So maybe we could, you know, join the party with you. <laughs> right. um, so this week, we are going to talk a little bit about a situation that occurred this week and then some conversations that have occurred since then. Um, and so without further ado... Um, let's introduce the concept of just kind of hiring practices around um, underrepresented people and how those can be construed, perceived, all of those good things. So, um, Jackie, I know, you know, we, we know kind of some of the rules around affirmative action. We know some of the rules around, um, you know, why we should be hiring underrepresented and marginalized folks. But, but we're not lawyers. Um, but we're not lawyers. So yes, good. I love that we always call that out. We are not here for legal advice. Um, we can pretend that we're lawyers on TV, but it's no. not true, people. It's not true. Not true. Don't listen um, to that. I don't have that piece of paper. No. Um, so I had a situation this week where I had a leader talk to me a little bit about the fact that he was um, anxious about promoting one of his internal team members who was a Hispanic male, so from an an underrepresented group in his organization. And he said he didn't want it to feel like he was just doing it because the person was Hispanic. And so first, let's just start there. (laughs) Let's start with that. (laughs) Okay, so so was he admittingly saying that the guy is undeserved of this position? Uh, no, he absolutely deserved the position because that was one of my first questions, of course. Right. Because no one would think it was tokenized if they felt like he earned it. Mm-hmm. Right. And you bring up a whole nother question. Like, I'm afraid to promote the one Hispanic man in this department because it would look like I did it because he was Hispanic. It just serves to that why we need to have <laughs> inclusion. Right. Because if you had an equal, fair balance, no one would think that. Right. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing that, you know, it's interesting because um, I think so many folks, there is that anxiety. And and we've talked already about CEOs being anxious, especially just in the current environment with every move they make, but would, you know, how do we do this and how do we do this the right way? So it doesn't come across as some sort of token action or, um, you know, just uh, performative, you know, performative inclusion, whatever you want to call it, because I think there's just such a anxiety around that, but it's just, it's not okay. It's wrong. You know, we need to be doing this the right way. I think part of that is generational, mm-hmm. honestly. Um, Cause you know, this week I had someone tell me that they didn't want to call someone out as being disabled. And I was like, but it says here, like they're referring to themselves as disabled. So I think it's okay. And they Mm -hmm. were like, well, I don't want to just do that. And I think some of the stuff just comes from people being so afraid and it's not even steeped in reality. You're afraid of what you don't know, what some of the backlash could be because you had another situation this week too. Mm -hmm. Yes. That was was, um, similar. That's what you get for choosing like one of your BFFs to do a podcast with. I know your business. <laughs> that yes. other situation might fall into place here too. Yeah. You know, I think it's, I just feel like there's so much going on. And yes, you have gotten a few calls from me this week, just a little exhausted. And at the time I was actually trying to figure out where to go drop off my ballot. So, you know, there's a lot going on. (laughs) (laughs) There is a lot going on. And I think people need to understand because one of the things that came into play this week at my office, we were talking about OFCCP, the way that if, first of all, there's tons of acronyms Mm -hmm. all over the place. Mm -hmm. OFCCP, what is a, a, what official federal something 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 yeah 
something 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 that's and, right now Jackie, there's that's proof. exactly what it stands he for he did something. think we were lawyers before <laughs> So now it's a, a regulate really it's a regulatory body that basically makes sure that your your hiring practices are appropriate and fair separate from EEOC though OFCCP does a little bit more around you know if you have a reduction in force are you are you looking at um, how you're choosing or selecting who will be uh, part of a reduction in force things like that it's but the, the office of federal contract compliance programs so yeah, government go. contractors yes is really what this goes into as far as like the hr world mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely and so yeah i think there's a there is just so much regulation of some of these things so there so that also kind of is a layer if they are a, an organization that has government contracts they have a different set of rules that they need to be thinking about when they're doing any of this work as well so I, yeah share more about your your situation because i think it's interesting sure well so what had happened was what had happened was there was a document um that came that was associated with uh my company it was just like a blog post that someone said you can take race into consideration when you're doing hiring and so the person read that one sentence and just completely panicked and was like, no, you can't consider race when you are doing hiring. And the rest of the sentence said, as long as it's in alignment with your AAP program, which is affirmative action program, right? Mm -hmm. The reason this gets confusing is like, you take the private sector and you take the public sector and then you take government contractors, which is yep. totally different from that. Yep. So all of what's, I think what's really funny is all of these things are trying to right wrongs, you know, mm -hmm. making sure you don't discriminate against marginalized peoples, making sure that you're not leaving people out, just discriminating because they were a veteran, which happened, especially like during Vietnam, they would be like, their political beliefs would cause them not to hire veterans, which is why, part of the reason why it's such a big deal and why we add those when we're talking about diversity. Mm -hmm. Then you have affirmative action saying, no, you have to hire these marginalized groups because you haven't in the past. And then right. you have equal opportunity, which is we're not gonna discriminate. It's all these things. And yet when people are afraid, they decide to do nothing and just not hire marginalized groups, right. which is weird, right? Like that's like, you would think it would be the opposite. You would think they would say, well, I don't wanna discriminate against anybody. So I'm gonna hire diverse populations. Instead, mm -hmm. the opposite is true. Like, I don't want this black woman to know that I'm hiring her because she's a black woman. So I, I don't want people to think that I'm hiring her because she's a black woman. So I'm just not going to hire her at all. Right. It would just be easier just in versus, case. Versus, and, and this goes to kind of another point. And I know we have talked about this. I don't know that we've talked about it on the podcast, but the whole concept around lowering the bar or that, that idea that folks so many times say, oh, well, I don't want to lower the bar, which is just super insulting, insulting to anyone in a, you know, historically marginalized group of why in the world would you think you're lowering the bar because you're hiring someone who is diverse or, you know, is underrepresented on your team. And so I think there's the way I look at it and, you know, affirmative action has a lot of things about it that made sense at the time. Correct. It's kind of like the union concept as well, where unions, absolutely there is a time and a place where they are necessary, they are needed but it's almost the that necessary uh unfortunate necessity of having that and that's similar to affirmative action plans in my mind is if we had just done the right thing from the get-go and and that's also kind of me saying that in 2020 very different times when these conversations started and very different times when some of these rules were set into set in place of hey these are things you need to consider or these are things you need to do and Affirmative action is one that I have been in organizations where they have had a plan and have been in organizations where they do not. So government contract and not. And it's always an interesting conversation because I am very much, and I think so many folks in HR are very much trying to, you know, hold that line of what are the competencies, what are the values that we want that candidate to have when we're bringing them into the organization. And, and then you have that layer of, oh, well, we, you know, we need to hire a African-American woman or we need to hire a whatever, whatever. And it's very frustrating because it is that 
no, you should just have a diverse candidate slate, period. End of discussion. It shouldn't be something that you're having to do something extra. You need to be sourcing from the right places and getting people that are diverse. So, yes. And so part of it, too, is because you have affirmative action that is supposed to be regulating to make sure that you're actually equal opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. And yet you can't have a quota, but you have to hire marginalized groups. But if you put a number on it, skirt you're in trouble and you can increase it by a certain percentage, but you can't have a number. Cause if you have a number, that's a quota, quotas are un- illegal. So then you mm-hmm. have the OFCCP. You can't hire because of race unless you can prove that you did in the past. And then you can say, oh, look, we haven't hired these people, but you still can't discriminate against them because of race, yet you're still required to hire these people. And that's why it's a cluster. And that's why people get so confused. And that's why people are like, I don't even know what to do. What and I don't want do. anybody to. And what's weird is that people think that they're regulated by things that they're not. Like Mm -hmm. this situation we are talking about is the public, like this is like just government contracts. There are the, of course, affirmative action and EEOC goes on when you're in, you know, not the government. However, in the situation that you were talking about earlier, it just reminded me of those laws because it's like, who is going to think he is tokenized? And somebody might think that, I mean, who, did you ask him that, by the way? I did not. I did not. And can we get him live yes. right now? Let's, let's call him. Let's bring him on. Oh, Sunday afternoon. What are you doing, sir? Um, no. Okay. So here's the thing. I think that there is this concern. Obviously he was concerned about the fact, like, how would this look? How would it be perceived because of the current environment? But the, the frustrating part there is, if someone actually assumes that that is why that person got the promotion, you're doing something wrong. Correct. And what I mean by that is you're not communicating this person's performance, what they've done to achieve this. And so it's also about like that communication and that continuous communication. And this is something you and I talk about all the time around leaders. Like, how are you actually sponsoring and promoting folks, meaning not promoting, giving them a promotion, but talking about them in the right places at the right times so that folks know, wow, Jackie is an awesome team player. Jackie is knocking it out of the park. She's doing all here are X, Y, Z things that she's done versus springing something on them. That's like, that's right. Oh, Hey, here's Jackie. I know I've never said a word about her before, but now I'm going to promote her to a VP role. Then that is a sign of something else that's going on. And that means because in most organizations, well, I say that, and I work for, you know, a startup and worked for startup for several years. So I don't even remember what it's like on the corporate side. Right. I just know that in, in all the organizations that I've worked in up to this point, a promotion was obvious, right? Right. Like people would say this person works really hard or this person, uh, you know, did something or everyone felt like this person should mm-hmm. be promoted. Right. Um, and so it should be obvious. And so you wouldn't have that fear of right. that person. You would think you wouldn't have that fear because everybody would think they were being promoted because of, of their work. So mm-hmm. something is off as it far as like, whether they're doing regular, um, what do you call them? Performance reviews and calibrations. regular things that mm-hmm. people can back that stuff up. Right. And, and, and it just goes to show everyone else who is listening when you are, it's very important. Performance reviews are not just about people getting raises. It's very important to make sure that you're fair and balanced, that you have these things. And it's the same mm-hmm. for everyone. And it's accurate. And if it's not, then stop what you're doing in about, you know, 15 minutes when this is over and go get <laughs> that in place. Absolutely. I think that consistent and fair piece is what so many folks miss because we go with the squeaky wheel. Who's complaining about not being promoted or who has said it the most times in the last six months? That's the person I need to promote. And in this work, it does require you to step back and think about, are we consistently evaluating people? Are we being fair in our promotion process? Are we doing all the things that we need to do to make sure that no one would assume 
oh, because we're now doing this DNI work, now all of a sudden this Hispanic person gets uh, promoted. Now it must be because right. of the color of their skin. And, and it's like, no, no, it must not be. And, and that wouldn't be why you would want to do that. And, and I would never want the person being promoted to ever feel that that was the reason why to ever feel in any way or to have someone call them out in such a, a way of like, oh, well, we know why you were promoted because that's not great either. Like, it's just one of those things that there's such a, like all of the things as we're talking about this and all of the regulations, all of the pieces that you need to look at, it feels so overwhelming. Yes. But this is also where you need to have that great HR person to help you and navigate some of the stuff because of these very things. it's sketchy and dicey. Right. I mean, it all, it, it, and you know, the thing is that, and it sounds really simple. You really, the policy that you need to implement at your company is really the golden rule, which mm-hmm. is, you know, treating people the way you would like to be treated and the platinum rule of treating people the way they would like to be treated in certain situations. And if you had that in place, you'd be good. You right. know, you'd be good. And I want you to say that again, the platinum rule again, because I think that's one that is so critical right now as we think about every individual on our team. Yes, the platinum rule is treating people the way they want to be treated. And that means like you're not making a decision for somebody else. You've actually spoken Mm -hmm. with them. You've seen where their needs are. And that's also how you can have that equitable piece because you need to know where somebody feels like maybe they are needing additional assistance. Maybe you, they need a little extra support or resources. Maybe there is something that you can do to make sure things are fair and balanced. Um, and it also is important that we keep, like diversity doesn't end through the recruiting process. Um, For those of you, if you are not familiar with um, me or Katie, Katie's been primarily on the human resources side. I've been primarily on the recruiting side. And so we kind of bring that to the table. And and, um, what I see is a lot of people start and end in the recruiting process. Mm -hmm. And then they don't know when it gets to where you are, where it's promotion and doing those performance reviews, then all of a sudden, you know, they haven't been tracking it. Yeah. And I mean, and I think this also goes to why people leave organizations. We know, you know, just from the data that's been collected through exit interviews, through conversations with folks when they've left organizations that, you know, the whole idea of, oh, people leave bosses or people leave managers or, you know, that kind yes, that's absolutely one of the levers. Another lever though, is that career development. So people aren't leaving organizations to make more money they're leaving organizations because they don't feel like there's a career path. And it can be a, I don't see someone that looks like me in a senior leadership role or whatever that next level is, whatever it might be that they're wanting to be. But it also is, if I don't know what my next move is or how I'm going to continue to grow and learn, this is not the place for me. And I think especially with this current workforce, everyone wants to keep learning and keep growing and keep doing more versus being stagnant in a role because it's Absolutely. not it's no longer okay just to, to be in an organization and stay there for 30 years and then retire that is not the workforce that is working today and we are never going back to that and and quite honestly we're going in the opposite direction with the gig economy and you know doing that gig work versus how do we think about someone's career path but having those development opportunities, those growth opportunities within your organization where they can learn and grow and add to their toolkit is amazing. And it, and it isn't a, let me do this because I want them to stay for 10 more years. It's the right thing to do. And I want to develop our folks so they're the best of the best. Period. Well, and it's just going to be too easy to leave. Right. I mean, right now we know, I say that and as we're in the middle of a pandemic and we know mm-hmm. that people are not, you know, half of these people do not have jobs right now. Right. Um, it will turn around. It does turn around. At some point mm-hmm. it'll turn around. And there we have a talented workforce that is looking for opportunities right now. And we have a majority of our organizations that have remote workers right now. And so you can be in Boise, Idaho and hire a top person from Mm -hmm. San Francisco, um, a developer from Silicon Valley, 
and they can work there and you don't have to stay within your own talent pool or within your own demographic. You're mm -hmm. so, um, you better help your people. Agreed. And, and I think, again, it goes, you know, kind of circling back to the, the topic is all of those things you're saying, like we can now look at how we employ people differently than we have in the past, but it's also about, you know, continuing to establish this, this is the bar of what we're holding people to. And when we're hiring, we're doing that values add, that, that um, performance add, all of those things. So the competencies you're growing and building on your team might not be what you need right this minute, but they're what you're needing in the future and continuing to think about that because I, 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 I think there's so much going on around this whole topic of, um, you know, we want diverse people, but we can't find them. Oh, we want diverse people, but uh, we can't afford to pay them in San Francisco. And, you know, and there's so much that's evolving and shifting. And to your point, I mean, I, I know we're all on this, you know, on this news cycle talking about the fact that, you know, the relief and some of the things that I think people were expecting would happen in this kind of next wave of the pandemic aren't happening yet. And, you know, hopefully they come soon and someone can come to an agreement. Um, but in the meantime, we have so many folks that are in a desperate situation and looking for work. And, and that kind of leads to another topic around, you know, how do we think about people's resumes? How do we think about making sure people are okay? You know, all of those different things that come into play when you're hiring. Um, yes. yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a, a whole, I wouldn't even say rabbit hole. That's a whole place that we can explore because I think there's so much coming down, you know, in our future that we don't even know yet. We don't even know yet. We don't. Mm -hmm. But getting back to even the 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 first, getting back to the topic, the other part that is so interesting is, shouldn't he be really afraid that he doesn't promote this person and his diverse population, as limited as it is, leaves mm -hmm. and then feels like he was being discriminated against because he knew right. he was qualified, but he right. didn't get the opportunity. Like that should be more scary. I, I agreed. 1000% agree. And that was in a gentle way, what I may have shared. <laughs> gentle. I'm gently. Sure. Gently. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I think that's it. It's the, we have got to be thinking of this not as oh, hey, you know, I don't want them to think I'm promoting them for these wrong reasons. It's, oh my gosh, I need to promote them quickly and keep them engaged and keep them excited about work and, and know that they're valuable and know that I, as the CEO, value them or they'll leave. And, and I think that's just something that is so missed in this conversation is how do we make sure people understand that they are valued and, and that is the bottom line. You know, that's the piece that regardless of where you are in the process, regardless of the government and regulations, people need to feel valued and like they can contribute in a valuable way at work. So um, we can talk about all of the letters in the alphabet around government agencies and you know how we are regulated, but really it's do the right thing, period. And I, I think that's the part that folks get so caught up in, oh my gosh, I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna do that. Well hire for the right person and make sure that you're looking the right places to find different folks who can help you innovate and can help you drive more and better. And, and if I, you can't do it, hire someone who can. It's not amen. as difficult as right. you think. Exactly. Um, I was looking uh, another group when we talk about indigenous peoples or native American, what's looking and um, looking for resources where you could find um, those people and found something that I never knew that there were these tribal colleges, like mm -hmm. I think like 20 something around there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so wait, so people are saying they can't find people and yet, there's 20 that that is, you know, it historically and it promotes the advancement of Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And yet we can't find them. And then I found over 300 organizations that um, support or people are members of or looking to um, help the lives of Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And it's just 
It's and it's not that hard. Like I Googled no. it. I right. Googled it. That's my right. secret sauce is Google. Sometimes GTS. Google. GTS, baby. GTS. You know, I mean, it's not <laughs> all it's comes not back to that. Difficult as people would like to say. Right. And so it it really brings up the other piece that we've talked about when people are trying to understand part of the reason why it's difficult for people to have um, inclusion or having environments that are warm and welcoming. Um, there's this thing called confirmation bias. And so Wells Fargo, like we talked about in earlier episodes saying, oh, we can't find enough black people in banking. I'm telling you 30% of the banks were like, oh yeah, us, we can't either. And they were just like, yeah, us too. We, that confirmed right. it for them. Right. Meaning you're, you confirm something that you're already thinking you can find it anywhere and say, oh, well, mm -hmm. then we just can't do it. Right. Um, P.S. on LinkedIn this week, I saw like they were hiring like a diversity recruiter. Like I, I could not stop laughing. Like, good luck on that. Anyway. Right. Well, and, but, and I'm going to say this somewhere. about that diversity. Good on you. And please do start. But also, I think there's this myth and I and, and I love recruiters I grew up as a recruiter but there is this you know myth and it is a myth because I literally want to shake people when they say this like oh we can't find there's you know there's not that many of x whatever it is that they might be looking for and I just it, it is like nails on a chalkboard because I'm like this is harder than just posting it on LinkedIn or just posting it on whatever job board of your choice is. But guess what? These people do exist and you actually have to do your job to find them. Girl. And that's really what it... <laughs> I'm dropping the mic. Crazy, crazy stuff we're talking Call about here. Call me nuts, but... <laughs> Got to do your job. I do like you're fading into your party right now. I don't know what's happening. Over Look, there. and this is oh, this is party green. time. I forgot. My oh, is green. Nelly. Yeah, no, that's not a good idea, my friend. I not okay, I'll stay a good plan. Here. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Jackie's fading into her party. I think that's a sign that you want to go to your party. <laughs> is that I want to be? I am a member of the party. Yes. That's um, scary. Very much so. Um, oh, here we go. Back to green screen. I'm trying to fix it's getting crazy. This. Okay, I'm. 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 We're gonna cut this one because I wanna. I wanna see where we're going next. So, um, Jackie, what is your one takeaway for folks from this episode? Look at. I, I can't even look at me. I look so scary right now. Um, I would say don't wear don't wear green. That's your takeaway. I, mean, I didn't mean to. It worked at the beginning. All good. All good. Um, okay. I would say my my one takeaway is, you know, you really want to like at this point, it's so complex, but we know that it's such a big deal. Try mm -hmm. to opt in instead of opting out. Try to get people in and look at it and try to figure out a way to get people in instead of trying to get people out. Meaning if you just promote the guy, if he's worth it, he's doing all those things. Don't convince yourself that there's going to be a problem. It's mm -hmm. you're going to err on the side of diversity, right? You will be better off for it. I promise. I promise. Yeah, it, I don't even want to add anything to that. Cause I want to just say what you just said again, err on the side of diversity. That's the right answer, period. And, you know, with that, you know, I want to say thank you so much for joining us and we will be back soon. And I think the next episode, Jackie and I are going to talk about Oreo cookies, right, Jackie? Delicious, double stuff. <laughs> we'll be talking about their uh, most uh, recent commercial and and how that has really played out and, and some of the the comments and the the thoughts from folks around the, the Oreo cookie commercial that just recently aired. So thanks for joining us. We will be back soon with another episode of Inclusive AF. <laughs> Have a great day. I'll be at the party. <laughs> Bye.